Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now, here is Pastor Dennis Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Welcome to Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this Family Bible Study Hour. Ready to get back into our Father's Word here at the chapel, the book of Ezra. Uh, We invite you to get your Bible and join us if you care to. We'd love to have you. We're going to pick it up today with Ezra chapter 8 verse 1. And we were just introduced to Ezra uh, in chapter 7. And uh, he was led a group, a second group of people from Judah the Benjamites and the the Levites out of Babylon. Uh, Zerubbabel brought the first batch, which we covered beginning in chapter 1 of Ezra. Now Ezra is getting a second group together. And Darius, the king of Persia, uh, gave a lot of authority and and power to Ezra. He said, I want you to go back uh, to Jerusalem and I want you to set up judges and magistrates that will judge the people according to the law of the God of heaven, Yahweh, in other words. And that's, that's quite a bit right there. You see, he's, he was giving these people the authority to govern themselves, basically. He even gave Ezra uh, the right to appoint judges who could judge someone to death if that's what the law of God called for. Uh, He also opened up his pocketbook uh, quite uh, wide and gave a substantial amount of silver, uh, food stuffs, wheat, uh, corn, oil that the people might need to reestablish the worship of Yahweh. And why would that be important to a heathen king? Well, you see, he, he recognized and revered the God of heaven and, and I think he, which is not unusual for a king of Persia, uh, he would have a god of this, a god of that, and a god of this, and a god of that. Uh, so, but he wanted to seek the favor of the Lord, and that's basically uh, what his stake in all this was, was to uh, seek the favor of the Lord, just as Cyrus, the king of Persia, that allowed Zerubbabel and his group to leave. But we're uh, getting ready to leave. He's got the letter in hand. Ezra has a letter in hand from Darius with a decree uh, from Darius saying all of these things that I just summarized for you. Uh, We're going to ask that word of wisdom in Yeshua's precious name. And you know, God chose a good one in Ezra. We learned in chapter 7 that Ezra was a ready scribe meaning that he was skillful in the Word of God. And if you want to bring somebody out of confusion, you want somebody who's skilled in the Word of God to do it. You see, truth dispels confusion. Truth dispels darkness. Let's ask that word of wisdom as we always do here at the chapel. Father, I ask you to open eyes, open ears, bring your children out of confusion today. Ezra chapter 8, verse 1, and it reads... These are now the chief of their fathers, or the heads of families. And this is the genealogy of them that went up with me from Babylon in the reign of Artaxerxes the king. And this would be in the seventh year of Darius's reign. Artaxerxes, don't let that throw you. It's an appellative like uh, Pharaoh. All kings of Egypt were called Pharaoh. They had another name just as Darius and Cyrus have other names, but Artaxerxes uh, means the great king. Now, uh, we're not going to cover this list of genealogy. It's quite lengthy, and you can read it as, as well as I can read it to you. I do want to cover a first name, a, f- a couple of the names in verse 2, and then we'll talk about it. Of the sons of Phinehas, Gershom, and the sons of Ithamar, Daniel, of the sons of David, Hattush. And when you see sons, it means descendants. It might very well be a grandson or a great-grandson. But we, we recognize these names, or we should. Phinehas, 
uh, was a, the son of Eleazar, the son of, 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 of Aaron. So we're talking priests here. Uh, Ithamar, there's only one person in all of God's word that is named Ithamar. He also was a son of Aaron. So we saw in, in chapter 2, uh, we saw the Nethanims already trying to say they were of the priesthood, but they couldn't prove their genealogy. And I think here we got people saying they're of Phinehas and Ithamar. Uh, we're going to see when they got outside of, of where they started their journey from, uh, they weren't of the priesthood. So with that, skip with me to verse 18, and we'll pick it up there. And I, this is Ezra speaking, gathered them together to the river that runneth to Ahava. Ahava is not only the name of a river, it's also the name of a city. And there abode we, or pitched, we better probably translate it, in tents three days. And I viewed the people and the priest, and found there none of the sons of Levi. Wait a minute now. Ezra realizes he has a problem. You see, he's been commissioned to lead these, this group of people back to Israel, Judah, Jerusalem, and to teach them God's word. Uh, he's going to need some help. He's going to need some priests. Uh, which was part of their function, uh, the ones who who performed their responsibilities, were teachers. Uh, he doesn't have one Levite, which means he doesn't have one priest, because you have to be a Levite uh, to be a priest. What he's got is a bunch of Nethanims, and I was quick to point out in our first lecture, the Nethanims play a big part in the book of Ezra. Uh, they they came about at the time of Solomon, and they were basically prisoners of war that were given, the very name Nethanim means given, they were given to the priest and the Levites to help with the menial labor in and around the temple, chopping wood for the altar fires, uh, hauling water to uh, wash the, for the priests to wash themselves in, to wash the sacrifices in, etc. But over the years, the priests and the Levites became lazy. Uh, they didn't want to leave their possessions in Babylon. They didn't want to come out of confusion. They were too comfortable there. Uh, and when you have people getting too comfortable, uh, they become fat, dumb, and sassy. And the Nethanim saw an opportunity, okay, well, the priest and the Levites don't want to assume those responsibilities. Uh, we can do that. Give us some priestly robes. Uh, give us uh, some paper and pencil, and we'll write out instructions for the people, not taking into light the Word of God. Among these Nethanims, you had, no doubt, some Kenites. Uh, Kenites, as early as 1 Chronicles chapter 2, verse 55, had already worked their way in as scribes. They said, give me some paper and pencil, and we'll write up the history of the tribe of Judah. You see, when you have people preparing the pasture, that's God's word for the sheep, you want to make sure that you have someone who is doing it according to God's way, not man's way. Uh, Nethanims uh, uh, have a tendency to give you the traditions of men. Jesus said himself in Matthew chapter 23, verse 2, the scribes and Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Who was Moses? Moses was the lawgiver. He gave us the word of God. And instead of hearing the word of God from the writings of Moses, you're hearing what the scribes and Pharisees have to say, which would be compared to probably what you would get in a quarterly today, written by man instead of God. Verse 16, <clears throat> Then sent I, again Ezra speaking, for Eliezer, for Ariel, for Shemaiah, these are all uh, Levitical names, and for El Nathan, and for Jarib, 
and for El Nathan, obviously a second man by the name of El Nathan, there'll be a third, and for Nathan, and for Zechariah, and for Meshulam, chief men, also for Joyarib, and for El Nathan, men of understanding. This Joyarib and El Nathan, men of understanding, that means that they are wise and prudent, especially when it comes to teaching. Again, Ezra realized when he looked around, he said, how many of you are Levites? And none of them were Levites, meaning none of them were priests. He knew he, wasn't, he was going to have well, the teaching all on himself. He was a capable teacher, but a little help would be uh, go a long ways. Verse 17, And I sent them with commandment unto Ido, the chief of the place, Caesapha, uh, and I told them what they should say unto Ido and to his brethren, the Nethanims, at the place Cassiphia, uh, that they should bring unto us ministers for the house of our God. Now this verse is a little confusing. Ido, the way this reads, and to his brethren, the Nethanims, one might be led to believe that Ido was of the Nethanim. I don't think so. I think Ido was a Levite. Uh, and what this is meaning, the brethren, doesn't mean brethren of the womb, such as Levites or uh, Aaronites, uh, more specifically of the priesthood, uh, but it's brethren in a wider sense, such as fellow servants in the temple. Anyone working in the temple would be in that uh, brotherhood, verse 18. And by the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of understanding, of the sons of Mali, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, and Sherib, excuse me, Sheribiah, and his sons and his brethren, 18. And 18 in biblical numerics is bondage. And Judah is coming out of bondage to the Babylonians at this time. Now we have again some names that, that we know are Levites. Mali, the son, he was actually the grandson of Levi. Uh, his father was Merari, one of the uh, three major families of the Levites. So we got two Mali and Sheribiah and 18. We've got a total of 20 uh, Levites so far. Verse 19. And Hashabiah and with him Jeshiah uh, the, of the sons of Merari, his brethren and their sons, 20. So 20 in verse 18. We've got 20 uh, Levites in verse 19. We've got a total of 40 Levites who have now come out of Babylon and are going to return to Jerusalem with Ezra to reestablish the worship of Yahweh. 40 in biblical numerics is probation. I think the Levites are on probation with God at this point in time. You see, none of them were quick to come out of Babylon with Ezra. Again, probably too comfortable uh, with uh, what properties, possessions they had in Babylon. They didn't want to leave that to return to their homeland to reestablish the worship of the Lord. Verse 20, also of the Nethanims, whom David and the princes had appointed for the service of the Levites, 220 Nethanims, all of them were expressed by name. We've got... Uh, with the first group that came out of Babylon with Zerubbabel and this group that came out with Ezra, we have 612 Nethanims. And that's a lot more Nethanims than what they had Levites and priests. Verse 21, Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river Ahava, that we might afflict, or, or humble, you could think of this, ourselves before our God, to seek Him a right way for us, and for our little ones, and for our substance. Make, make the way, the journey, uh, from Babylon to Judah, 
uh, easy for us. In other words, make it where our children and our substance are protected. It's not only a long journey, it's going to be some four months that they're traveling from Babylon to Judah. It's a dangerous route as well. Uh, you see, there are lots of marauding bands that uh, make a living stealing from people who are trying to cross this piece of property that they're going to be traversing. Uh, and what this right way for us, what he's asking is, God, make a straight way for us. And you know, God can do the same for you in your life. Uh, he can kick the rocks out of the road of your life, or he can uh, allow Satan to throw bricks at you. Uh, it all depends on you, whether, whether you're trying to be pleasing to God, whether you're trying to do things his way. He can make your life, the road straight, or he can make the road difficult, verse 22. For I was ashamed to require of the king a band of soldiers and horsemen to help us against the enemy in the way, because we had spoken unto the king, this is Darius the king of Persia, saying, The hand of our God is upon all them for good that seek him, but his power and his wrath is against all them that forsake him. What Ezra is saying is that we were ashamed uh, to ask for uh, soldiers from Darius after we were more or less boasting that God is, his hand is over and on the righteous and against, his wrath is against them that forsake him. Uh, we, we, we thought that that would appear like a, a lack of faith on our part. After we said that God would protect us, then that would go against our faith if we then requested soldiers. So, and I think Ezra knew uh, the word of God well enough to know that God is his wall of protection. Uh, he wanted to depend on God, to have faith in God, to lead them this four months as they journeyed from Babylon uh, to uh, Judah. He, he suspected that God would be willing to help those who are willing to come out of Babylon, to come out of confusion. The very name Ezra means help. Verse 23, So we fasted and besought our God for this, and he was entreated of us. He saw our faith and he heard our prayers, and he gave us a safe journey. They haven't left yet. Verse 24, then I separated twelve of the chief of the priest, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and they were listed in verses 18 and 19 as Levites, but not priest, and ten of their brethren with them. And this is confusing to a lot of people. If you just read the first part of the phrase, I separated twelve of the chief of the priest. So we got twelve priests. Then Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and ten of their brethren. Uh, yes, so, so you've got twelve priests and twelve Levites is what this verse means. And I weighed unto them the silver and the gold, and the vessels, even the offering of, or for, the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his lords and all Israel were present had offered those of Israel who weren't making the journey from Babylon to Israel were encouraged to give free will offerings as well as the king and his counselors and everyone else that wanted to send and and this is a good idea keeping good records and, uh, and anytime church finances are handled you want to have more than one person involved it's a practice that we uh, have established here at Shepherd's Chapel and follow to the letter, uh, in the, such as when we're opening mail and there are finances involved with that, uh, donations, orders for uh, tape, CDs, Bibles, etc. And we always have at least two and usually more people than that present when the mail is being opened. And you keep uh, good records and you make people accountable and responsible uh, for this. And when they say weighing, what they're talking about 
that was the, the, the way that you determine how much silver you had. You didn't count it as how many shekels or whatever, but it was by weight. And you put it on the scales, and that's how much weight you had, that's how much silver. And then when they get to Jerusalem, they're going to weigh it again to make sure none of it has disappeared along the way. 26. I even weighed unto their hand 650 talents of silver. That's a lot of silver. A talent weighs between 110 and 180 pounds, depending on whose measure you go by. And silver vessels and 100 talents, and of gold 100 talents. Verse 27, and also 20 basins, or you could think of these as bowls of gold of a thousand drams, that's a weight, and two vessels of fine copper, precious as gold, as desirable as gold. In other words, this fine copper, more probably, more likely, uh, a shining brass, if you will. And all of this weighed so that it could be written down how much there was, and then, as I said earlier, when they get to Jerusalem, they'll weigh it again to make sure none of it has disappeared. Accountability and responsibility. Verse 28, And I said unto them, Ye are holy unto the Lord. That's these twelve priests and twelve Levites that we were talking about in verse 24. The vessels are holy also, and the silver and the gold are a free will offering unto the Lord God of your fathers. Now, anything, what this is saying is anything that's offered to the Lord becomes holy. Uh, that word in the Hebrew tongue is uh, kodesh. And of things, it's consecrated or dedicated things. Uh, as far as the priest and the Levites, uh, there would not be, of course, things, but uh, anything that's separated to serve the Lord is also considered to be holy. Verse 29, Watch ye and keep them until ye weigh them before the chief of the priests in Jerusalem, in other words, and the Levites and chief of the fathers of Israel at Jerusalem in the chambers of the house of the Lord and the chambers of the house of the Lord uh, from the time of even Solomon's temple. There were two treasuries established in the house of God, and that's what is being referred to here in these chambers. But when you get to Jerusalem, weigh the gold and silver and the other precious metals, uh, the bowls again to make sure uh, everything has arrived. You are accountable, in other words. Verse 30, So took the priest and the Levites the weight of the silver and the gold and the vessels to bring them to Jerusalem unto the house of our God, responsible for the safe transport of these precious metals. And they would need those in the worship of the temple. Uh, a lot of this uh, bowls were probably stolen by the armies of Nebuchadnezzar uh, during the, the three sieges against Jerusalem when they first went into uh, captivity to the Babylonians. So uh, Ezra has a decree from Darius in his hand giving him authority to establish judges and magistrates. Uh, they have a lot of gold and silver and other precious metals. Uh, they've got Levites, they've got priests. Now it's time to make their way from Babylon uh, coming out of confusion to Jerusalem, 31. Then we departed from the river of Ahava on the twelfth day of the first month. And that's only two days from Passover. I'm going to guess that they probably uh, skipped the Passover this year in that they were away from their homes uh, trying to get back home. But uh, all in all, it would take some four months to make this journey, to go unto Jerusalem. And the hand of our God was upon us, and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy, and of such as lay in wait by the way. And this, again, is not just a long journey. It was a dangerous journey. 
and they prayed that God would show them the way, a safe way, and to protect them from the enemy, and God did so. God protects those who come out of Babylon. 32, and we came to Jerusalem and abode there three days. After a four-month journey, three days is not an abnormal amount of time to rest. Uh, the book that follows Ezra and Nehemiah will see that Nehemiah and that group that came out of Babylon and went to Judah uh, also rested for three days. Verse 33. Now on the fourth day was the silver and the gold and the vessels weighed in the house of our God by the hand of Merimoth, uh, the son of Uriah the priest. And with him was Eleazar the son of Phinehas. And with them was Josabad the son of Yeshua, and Noadiah uh, the son of Benui, uh, Levites. And again, uh, churches should follow this example. Keep good records, make sure that people are accountable and responsible. But after resting for three days, they uh, time to call the people to account that were responsible and uh, everything came out just the way it was supposed to. By, the num by number and by weight of every one, and all the weight was written at that time, all present and accounted for. Now, uh, if you have a companion Bible, you'll have a note that beginning with verse 35 is the beginning of the fourth setter. Uh, now, a, let me explain. A setter is a prescribed amount of reading in the original manuscripts. And what this proves is that uh, this fourth setter begins here in the book of Ezra and ends in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. And in the manuscripts, if someone were to take uh, the, the scroll and read, there was a prescribed amount that they were to read. They were called seterum, uh, that's plurals of setter. And if the book of Ezra was to be treated separately than the book of Nehemiah, you would not have uh, this fourth setter ending in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. It proves that these two books are in the manuscripts are to be treated as one book, which we will do in our studies. Verse 35. Also, the children of those that had been carried away, those that had been carried away to Babylon, which were come out of the captivity, offered burnt offerings unto the God of Israel, twelve bullocks for all Israel, remembering uh, even the ten northern tribes who were in captivity to the Assyrian. Ninety and six rams, seventy and seven lambs, twelve he goats for a sin offering. All this was a burnt offering unto the Lord. And uh, I'll mention once again that uh, for our younger audience, God does not want burnt offerings today. Uh, we learn in Hebrews chapter 9 verses 13 and 14, if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a red heifer uh, could sanctify or make one clean, how much more the blood of Jesus Christ. Today we wash our sins in the blood of Jesus Christ, not the blood of goats and bulls. Verse 36, and they delivered the king's commissions, that's the uh, royal decree, the letter that Darius sent with Ezra, unto the king's lieutenants. This word lieutenants is a Persian title. Uh, it's satrap in the Syriac language, uh, and it's a title. And to the governors on this side of the river, meaning the west uh, side of the Euphrates. And they furthered the people and the house of God. This word furthered is uh, to lift up, as in to support. So. Uh, Ezra is off to a good start here. He's got the people uh, coming out of Babylon. Uh, there's trouble on the horizon, though. You see, a lot of the folks, uh, including the priests and Levites, had taken strange wives. And by strange, I don't mean that their behavior 
uh, was out of the ordinary. I mean that they were foreigners. They were not of Israel. And that is particularly, <clears throat> excuse me, a no-no for the priest. Why? Because the priesthood, that seed line, was to be kept pure. Uh, a Levite man was not allowed to take even a woman of, say, the tribe of Judah to wife. He had to take a, a daughter of the tribe of Levi to wife. We won't get far, but let's go ahead and start chapter 9, verse 1. <clears throat> now, when these things were done, the princes, these would be the princes of Israel, came to me, to Ezra, saying, The people of Israel and the priest and the Levites have not separated themselves from the people of the lands, the foreign lands, doing according to their abominations, their idol worship, <coughs> excuse me, even of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the Egyptians, <coughs> excuse me, and the Amorites. Now, the Ammonites and the Moabites, it wasn't, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it wasn't forbidden for the men of Israel to take wives or vice versa of the Ammonites and Moabites. You see, originally, the, they are descendants of the nephew of Abraham, Lot. And uh, it wasn't until they started uh, seducing the people of Israel to worshiping their gods, small g, that God forbade them from taking Ammonites and Moabites to wife. Now, the rest of these, other than the Egyptians, are all Canaanites. Uh, the Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites, Amorites are all tribes of the Canaanites. And most of them, especially the Perizzites, had mixed with the Nephilim, that's the fallen angels, and the Geber, the giants, were the result of that. So. We've got a major problem here. Uh, over the years and the captivity, uh, these people have taken strange wives. And God's law, uh, Exodus chapter 34, verses 12 through 16, Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 1 through 4, make it very clear. Uh, you know, and if you might say, well, that sounds kind of racist to me, that, that, that they can't take wives or give their daughters to their sons to marry, well, then go ahead and call God a racist. But that's the way he wanted it. And why? In Deuteronomy chapter 7, he makes it very clear. If you give your daughters to their sons to marry or take their daughters for your sons to marry, you're going to start worshiping their gods. And God knew, and he was exactly right, because that's exactly what happened uh, over the course of the years. How will Ezra handle this news that's being brought to him by the princes of the tribes of Israel? Uh, don't miss the next lecture and you'll find out. We've got a short message. We'll ask you to listen a moment, won't you please? Genesis 1:46, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world that was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular CDs. How and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you have always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Welcome back. We're glad you could join back with us. Let's have the 800 number, please. 800-643-4645. That number good throughout Puerto Rico, uh, the U.S. and Canada. If you have a biblical question that you'd like to pose to possibly be answered on the air, feel free to call that 800 number and leave your question. 
I say possibly answered, you know, this program goes into millions of homes around the world and uh, we get quite a stack of questions. And But I know this, if the Holy Spirit wants your question to be there, it will be there. So uh, please don't ask questions about a specific individual denomination or organization by name. Uh, we teach God's Word in a positive manner, throwing out negative about others by name, especially our brothers and sisters in Christ serve no purpose. We simply won't do it. We'll let God's Word do the teaching, the correcting, and the healing. If you're studying via the internet somewhere around the world that's not able to use that 800 number, your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Quite all right to mail your questions and being the point. Got a prayer request? Well, you don't need a telephone number. We can do away with it. Your Heavenly Father is there for you 24-7. I encourage you to talk to Him. You know, a lot of His kids today, His children, don't seem to have time for Him. They, they just forget about Him, and uh, He doesn't like that. He has emotions and feelings just like we do. How do I know? We were created in His image. We have feelings and emotions. Our Heavenly Father has feelings and emotions, and it hurts His feelings when His children basically abandon Him, forget about Him, talk to your Father, let Him know that you love Him, let Him know that you appreciate the many blessings. You don't think you're getting blessings, you're taking them for granted, friend. We do have these prayer requests. We come united as one in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, Father. We ask you to look upon these. You know their needs, Father. We have. Uh, addictions to drugs, alcohol, Father. People need a helping hand, Father. If it is your will, we ask a special blessing on each of them. And we lift up our military troops who are in harm's way around the world, Father. We ask you to watch over, God, direct, touch, heal. In Jesus' precious name, amen and thank you, Father. All right, let's get to some questions and see what's on the mind of folks. First up, we have <clears throat> Brenda in Mississippi. What are the different earth ages? Does that mean we are uh, reincarnated? That's commonly misthought uh, when people hear about the three earth ages for the first time. Uh, their mind takes off and they're coming up with reincarnation. There's no such thing as reincarnation. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 uh, states that it is appointed to man but wants to die. Um, the three world ages, it's a little too long of a subject for me to explain in the time I have here in this broadcast. I would recommend, Brenda, that you order uh, CD 30506 entitled Three World Ages. Uh, every month when we send out our monthly newsletter on page three, you have a list of suggested studies for new students, both on CD or cassette tape. And we suggest those as a starting place for people who don't really know where to start studying. And if you'll study those, it'll give you a foundation. Three World Ages is on that list. I can tell you this, if you don't understand the Three World Ages, there's no way you're going to completely understand the Word of God. Ken in Illinois, who baptized Jesus and where in the Bible does it talk about this? Well, you can read about it in one of the Gospels, Matthew uh, chapter 3. Uh, John the Baptist there reluctantly baptized Jesus. He said, I'm in need of your baptism. You don't need my baptism. Uh, John initially forbade Jesus saying, I have need to be baptized of you. Jesus answered, suffer it now, allow it, which means allow it now. And the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, descended like a dove. And a voice was heard from heaven, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Lois from West Virginia, several years ago, <clears throat> a preacher taught that the name Jesus was a name for a false god. I know Yeshua is his real name, but is Jesus a false name and should we pray to Yeshua instead? I want to serve the one and only God, so I'm concerned about praying to a false god. Well, uh, the disciples asked Christ in Matthew chapter 6, you know, how do we pray? Teach us how to pray. 
And Jesus taught them there. You, you pray to God, our Father who is art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, is how Jesus started off the prayer. Now you don't want to repeat that canned prayer written by someone else uh, every time you pray to God. He's just showing you the, the basics, the outline of how you pray to God. God wants to hear from your heart, from your mind, and, and he doesn't want to hear a prayer that someone else wrote. He'd much rather hear what's on your mind. Buck from Virginia. Uh, where in the King James Bible does it say in the end times there will be blood up to the horse's bridles? You're thinking of uh, Revelation chapter 14, verse 20, uh, when the cup of God's wrath is poured out is what's going on there. Where does it say Christ came not to change one jot of the law? That Christ, say the reason I ask that is two people have told me that Christ changes the food laws. Jesus came not to change anything his father said. It is not talking about food when the Lord let down the sheet to Peter. Am I right? You're completely right. Uh, where Jesus said, I came not to change one jot or tittle, that's a smallest letter, uh, or even the smaller ornamental dot that changes the pronunciation of one letter uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. Now, many people read Acts chapter 10 and think that the sheets lowering down with the unclean animals in them were somehow making it okay for Peter and therefore us to eat unclean animals. That's not what's going on in Acts chapter 10. <clears throat> in Acts chapter 10 verse 28 ex explains very plainly what all was happening in the previous verses of Acts chapter 10. And Peter said, now I understand what God was teaching me and that is to call uh, no man unclean, meaning the Gentiles, you see Cornelius was a Gentile and he was coming to visit uh, 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 Peter and Peter was being taught, you don't uh, put off the Gentiles. If they're seeking your, the Yahweh and the Holy Spirit, uh, you don't deny them. Hope that helps. Gracie in Michigan, I hope you're doing well. I would like to know about Passover. Okay, and I'm doing very well. Thank you for asking if you're referring to my health. I uh, had another uh, round with cancer last year, but uh, uh, praise God, uh, he's cleansed me once again. We're good to go. Uh, your question's about Passover. What is it? Well, in Exodus uh, chapter 12, the first Passover, uh, was when uh, Israel was still in bondage to the Egyptians. And uh, the Passover lamb was slain. The people of Israel were to take some of the blood of the Passover lamb and place it on the doorpost of their homes and the death angel would pass over. You see, that was the night that God took the firstborn of every man, every beast in Egypt. He was trying to convince Pharaoh to let uh, his people go soon after they did. You say, who is it? In reference to Passover, uh, today our Passover is Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. He, he became, he, he, his blood is the blood now, today, that causes the death angel to pass over and give us all the opportunity at eternal life. Why do we need it? Well, now that you know who it is, I don't think I need to answer that question. When do we need it? We need it every day. And I want you all to be everyday Christians, not a one hour a week Christian who goes and occupies a pew in a church for one hour a week, uh, be an everyday Christian. We need his salvation every day. Allen in South Carolina. <clears throat> um, uh, 
I've had a stroke and I do not think very well. There is something that for some reason strikes me and we hope you recover fully from that, Alan. Mark chapter 10, verse 31, Luke 13, 30, first shall be last, the last shall be first. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 45, the first Adam was made a living soul, the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Is there a connection with these verses? And no, I don't believe so. Uh, the first <clears throat> shall be last and the last shall be first uh, is, is speaking about God's election. Uh, they uh, were the first fruits and they served God in a very special way in the first earth age, but they're going to be last in the flesh through this, the second earth age. Why? Because they're going to stand for God again and witness against the Antichrist. <clears throat> they are uh, the first resurrection. They take part in the first resurrection also of Revelation chapter 20, uh, verses 4 and 5. David from Georgia, I am writing you to ask, did King Ahab go bad because of his wife Jezebel? The reason I ask this is because I found a book about her on the front cover. She is a very beautiful woman. I've sent this question before, but I've never heard an answer. I hope it makes the program. It had, did make the program this time. David, Ahab was plenty evil on his own. Um, they deserved each other because they were so very evil. Uh, their children weren't any better. Athaliah and uh, the, the, the son of Ahab and, and Jezebel who became the king of Israel uh, were pretty rotten people themselves. Athaliah uh, basically wiped out the seed, the king line of David, except for one who escaped. And if not for that, the seed line to Messiah would have been wiped out. That's the reason God protected that seed line. Ahab was plenty rotten on his own. He didn't uh, need a lot of help from Jezebel, uh, but when you put the two together, you really had an evil pair. Angela from Tennessee. Is Saturday the true Sabbath and in the thousand year reign, the ones left, will they also have new bodies? Will their bodies be changed? All changed, uh, but many will still be spiritually dead. Uh, I'm speaking of Revelation chapter 20. I just mentioned the elect will take part in the first direct resurrection, but the dead uh, shall not be, for the th will remain dead for the thousand years of the millennium. Why? And they're not physically dead, they're spiritually dead. You asked about the Sabbath, and we Sabbath every day here at Shepherd's Chapel. Our high Sabbath is Jesus Christ, the Passover. There is no higher. Uh, I pray you understand what I'm asking. My daughter asked me, and I didn't know how to answer. Again, the Sabbath means rest. Uh, Hebrews chapter 4 it tells us that Sabbath our rest is Jesus Christ, and again, put your rest in Him every day, not just one day a week. Elizabeth in Kentucky. <clears throat> now, uh, tell God and Jesus you love Him, and I do many times. Now I'm confused. If we don't love everyone else, will God hold it against me? I don't hate anyone. Well, some people, uh, Elizabeth, are impossible to love. Uh, I don't love Satan. Uh, certainly God doesn't love Satan. And, you know, there are uh, things that, that God hates. Uh, what is it? Proverbs chapter 6 verse 16 in the following verses. There you have six things there that God hates, and the seventh is an abomination to him. So, uh, yeah, we are to love others uh, as we love ourselves. That's the golden rule. But some people are just impossible to love, and 
You're not required as a Christian to love someone who's sitting there hitting you on the head with the two before. That, that doesn't make any sense. LaDonna in Alabama. Where in the Bible can I find when two or more are gathered in his name, he will be there? Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, where two or more are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. And you know, we're gathered together in his name as we do this program. Uh, we're studying the, the letter, uh, the, and Jesus is the living word, uh, so we are gathered together in his name for this program. Anthony from Oklahoma. Many people in black uh, community churches not understanding 1 Thessalonians 4.16 believe that when Christ returns, the graves will open up and give up the dead. They go by the resurrection of Christ. The body was not found they disregard the statement by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 44, that we have two bodies, but in black community churches, they teach that the spirit body reunites, uh, reunites with the flesh body. Now, it's not just in black community churches that uh, people are, are don't understand uh, six, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 8, which again, Paul teaches us that we have two bodies. And to be absent from the flesh body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verses 6 and 7, when we die, the flesh returns to the earth from which it came, the spirit returns to the Father from whence it came. So, and I know you're trying, Anthony, to, to help the people of that church understand the truth, but it's important that you understand that your responsibility ends at planting the seed. And from there, it's up to God whether that seed germinates and grows into a plant uh, that's capable of producing fruit, uh, think spiritually, uh, and, or whether it won't. And so uh, once you've planted that seed, you've done your job. Gilbert in Texas, where in the Bible does it say what Jesus did during the three days after he was crucified? Immediately after his flesh died, the veil of the temple was rent from top to bottom. You see what the veil was in the temple, it prevented people from going into the Holy of Holies, which is where God resided when he was here on earth. Uh, the Ark of the Covenant was here on earth uh, dwelling with man. But what that means is that Christ rent the veil from heaven to earth that prevents us from entering into uh, the presence of God. You have the right now, because Christ rent that veil, to go right on in to that Holy of Holies. You have the right to approach God in prayer. Uh, also, during that period of time, he went to the spirits in prison to preach the gospel, the good news. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. You see, it wouldn't have been fair for God to judge all the people who had died uh, since the time of Noah, for example, uh, who were living under the law equally with those who now live under the dispensation period of time of grace, meaning all we have to do is say we're sorry and mean it and ask for forgiveness and our sins are washed away. So Jesus went to those who had died before he paid the price on the cross and preached the gospel many believed as it's written in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 4. Ryan in Tennessee, heard you say God hated Esau. I don't believe God hated him. I thought we are supposed to love everyone. Bible doesn't say hate. Boy, you are biblically illiterate, Ryan. <clears throat> Malachi chapter 1 verse 3 makes it very clear that God loved Jacob and hated Esau. Romans chapter 9 verse 13 uh, is a second witness to that. God loved Jacob and he hated Esau. You say the word hate doesn't appear in the Bible. 
<clears throat> you need to read Proverbs chapter 6, verse 16. I mentioned that in a previous question. There are six things that God hates listed there. You need to get your cracking, and by that I mean get cracking the pages of your Bible open so you're not so biblically illiterate. Diana from Missouri, on your program you said not to wish everyone a good day or say God bless if they aren't a believer. Would it be okay to say, may God bless you if it's God's will? <laughs> that's, that's okay. If anything that you wish in God's will is okay. <clears throat> and what Diana is talking about, second epistle of John, verses one, excuse me, chapter one, verses nine and 10, it states there that if any come to you that have not this doctrine, meaning the doctrine of Jesus Christ, uh, don't wish them Godspeed, which is a, a salutation such as, have a nice day. Alice in Michigan, is the mark of the beast put on us as a literal chip or a mark? No, it is in your forehead, meaning in your mind. It's, it's in your thoughts. It's not something that people, you know, if you have a tattoo put on your arm, it doesn't change what you think in your head. Uh, you need to order the mark of the beast. The phone call is free. Uh, the, we don't even ask for the postage for the shipping. The CD is free. And you need to order that because it's getting light in the game. And I'm fear too many are going to be deceived. Order the free Mark of the Beast. I'm out of time. I, I love you all a great deal. Why? Because you do enjoy studying the Word of God. You're going to have the seal of God in your mind, not the Mark of the Beast in your mind. And, you know, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you and to reach out to others who are lost in this world of darkness. Most important this, you stay in his word every day. Every day And Father's word is a good day, even with trouble. Do you know why? It's because Jesus Yeshua is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Dennis Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast CD, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a CD catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, P.O. Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at the same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you.